That day, I had a terrifying class. Okay, let's get started. Meton sensei I'm looking forward to your class today. First, we'll review factorials. A factorial means multiplying all the numbers from one up to a certain natural number. For example, the factorial of 3 is 3 times 2 times 1, so the answer is 6. Oh yeah, that's how it was. Similarly, the factorial of 2 is 2 times 1, which is 2. The factorial of 1 is just 1 itself. Now then, Sundaman, can you calculate this one? The factorial of 1 half? Hmm, what does that even mean? If I follow the definition, do I multiply numbers from 1 down to 1 half? No, wait, that doesn't make sense. Isn't factorial supposed to be defined only for natural numbers? Well, that's understandable. Normally, you cannot calculate the factorial of 1 half. But it's okay. If we use something called the gamma function, we can generalize the factorial. What? what is this function? Meta-sensei, please explain. Very well. Let me explain. This function is defined as a special definite integral. Since we integrate with respect to t, the result does not depend on t. That means it is a function of x. Well, I guess that's true, but what does this integral actually mean? I'll explain that part later. Please do! Now, it is known that the gamma function has this form. That's a strange looking function. When x is a natural number, this function matches the factorial. Although you need to be careful, because n shifts by 1. So we can say this function is a generalization of the factorial. Wow, really? Let's look at an example. It is known that gamma 3 halves is equal to the square root of pi over 2. This corresponds to the factorial of 1 half. That's a pretty mysterious calculation. Well then, that's all for today's class. Huh? What about the explanation of that integral? Ah, about that. Unfortunately, even if I told you the answer now, you probably would not be satisfied. To understand this definition, you must move forward with your own steps. Wait a second. I don't get it at all. Where in the world did this definition come from? Why would an integral appear when trying to generalize the factorial? Is it even possible to reach this formula without any hints at all? But if I could derive this definition from scratch, maybe I could understand what this integral means. What? Where am I? I feel like I attended a strange class, but I can't remember. Sundaman, watch, watch out. out! Huh? Who's that? Whoa! What is this? It seems we are too late. You're... Mitan sensei Sensei, what are you talking about? Uh... Okay, quite a troublesome problem has come. Generalize the factorial. What could that even mean? The factorial of n means the factorial for natural numbers. That is, the usual factorial. But the factorial of x seems to mean the factorial for real numbers. Although we don't know how far it can be extended into the real numbers. So we need to extend the factorial to real numbers. Exactly, that's what it means. Boom. I feel like I saw the answer just a moment ago. But for some reason, I can't remember. Looks like we have to go on without hints. Meton sensei I'll leave the rest to you. Alright, let's work together and keep going. Before we tackle the problem, there is something we need to confirm. In general, the factorial of a natural number n means multiplying all natural numbers from 1 to n. Now, if we look at this part, it is actually the factorial of n minus 1. Hmm, I see. So the factorial of n can be written like this using the factorial of n minus 1. Yes, that is an important property of the factorial. Now, let's define 0 factorial to be 1. Then this equation will also hold true when n equals 1. Um, if I substitute n equals 1, the factorial of n minus 1 becomes 0 factorial. Yeah, the equation really works out. So far, this is just a review of factorials. Now then, how should we extend the factorial? Actually, the basic idea is very simple. That's our Meton sensei Well, I'm not really a teacher though. Anyway, let me explain the approach. First, let's plot the values of factorials on a plane. Then, it will look like this. So far, so good. Factorials are only defined for natural numbers including zero. That is why this graph only has discrete points. If we can define a function y equals g of x that passes through these points, then we will have extended the factorial to real numbers. Oh, I get it. Then let's make such a function. However, there can be infinitely many functions like that. What? 
Ah, but now that you mention it, if it only needs to pass through the points, then even a step-shaped function like this should be fine. That's right. If you want the function to be continuous, you could connect the points with straight lines like this. Hmm. I see. But somehow that feels like cheating. Yes, I suppose so. We want to extend the factorial in a natural way. We're not going to explore what natural really means here, but we do want to interpolate smoothly, like this. Yeah, this feels much better. In other words, we want to express n factorial in a different way. That is, by using a function g such that g of n represents n factorial. So let's find such a natural function g. Got it. But, how are we supposed to find it? I have absolutely no idea. True, it would be tough. Finding such a function right away is hard, so let's first focus on that property of the factorial. The factorial had this property. So our goal now is to find a function g that satisfies the same condition. We should be able to adjust the initial value later if needed. So the important part is this equation. I feel like the problem just got a little easier. And if a function g satisfies these conditions, then we've achieved our goal. Huh? Why is that? Then, try calculating this as a test. Uh, what do you mean? I should use this condition, right? This condition says that if you pull out n, the inside decreases by 1. So, if I pull out 3, the inside decreases by 1. Yes, yes, that looks good. And if I do the same with g of 2, 2 comes out in front, and the inside decreases by 1. If I do it once more, I finally get g of 0. And since g of 0 equals 1, the answer is 3 factorial. Well done, Zundaman. You showed that g of 3 equals 3 factorial. This can be proven in the same way for any natural number n. That means, if we can find a function g that satisfies this condition, then g of n equals n factorial, so g is the generalization of the factorial. Oh, I see. I feel like we've made a little progress. Hmm, but... Even if we say we want to find such a function g, I still have no clue where to even start. Calm down and look at this equation. Doesn't it look similar to a differentiation formula? A differentiation formula? Was there something like that? Wait. You pull out n and the inside decreases by 1. Ah, now I remember. This is just like the power rule. When you differentiate x to the power of n, n comes out as a coefficient and the exponent decreases by 1. That's exactly like the property of the factorial. Exactly right. And that's not all. This formula still holds even if n is extended to real numbers. So we can extend it from natural numbers to real numbers. Alright, I feel like we're getting really close to the answer. Wait, we can't relax just yet. There are still crucial differences between the two equations. The first difference is that the variable x has appeared. It didn't have to be x, but since it hadn't been used yet, I decided to use it. And the second difference, which is troublesome, g of n and g of n minus 1 are treated equally, but x to the n and x to the n minus 1 are not treated equally. Only x to the n is being differentiated. Yeah, only that side is differentiated. There is an imbalance between x to the n and x to the n minus 1. Right, we need to fix that first. Don't worry, there's a solution. Oh, good! The key is the product rule. To differentiate the product of two functions u and v, you differentiate each separately and then add the results. On the right-hand side, u and its derivative are treated equally. Ah, I see. If we replace u with x to the n in this equation, we get the next formula. Here, x to the n got differentiated. That means, x to the n minus 1 and x to the n are now treated equally. I feel like we got closer to the target equation, but it's also messier, so it feels like we moved further away. I understand how you feel, but we are making progress. For now, they look balanced, but the difference between v and v prime still bothers me. It's okay, there's a trick we can use. That's reassuring. Here we'll use the exponential function. The exponential function has the property that it keeps its form when differentiated. So, in the product rule, let's replace v with an exponential function in advance. Ah, oh, why is the exponent minus x instead of x? You'll see the reason soon. Now, if we let v be e to the minus x, it looks like this. 
Notice that a minus sign appeared due to differentiation. And then, if we rearrange the equation, we get this. Oh, that's amazing! Here, u and u prime are treated equally. Although an extra term appeared. We can handle that later. Got it. Now, if we replace u with x to the n, we get this equation. Alright, now, x to the n and x to the n minus 1 are treated equally. Though the formula is getting a bit complicated. That's true. Let's simplify the equation a little. Do you notice the same form appearing several times? Oh uh, yeah, I see it. So let's define g n of x like this. Then the left hand side is just g n of x. On the right hand side, we see g n minus 1 of x, and the derivative of g n of x. It looks much cleaner now. To summarize our progress so far, if we define a function g n of x like this, it satisfies the following equation. This is now in a form very close to our target condition. We made a lot of progress. Now then, we need to somehow eliminate the variable x. And that extra term also bothers me. We can probably handle that by using definite integrals. What? Why does integration suddenly appear? I don't really get it, but I'll leave it to you. Anyway, let's try integrating both sides. For now, let's set the integration interval from a to b, and decide the exact values later. I see. So that's how it works. Since we integrate with respect to x, the result does not depend on x. Well that's fine, but I'm still worried about this extra term. We want that part to become zero. But it's okay, this definite integral is very easy to handle. Here, since we're integrating after differentiating, we return to the original function. Then we just need to plug in the values at both ends of the interval. Got it. We want this value to become zero. So if we pick A and B, so that both results become zero, that should be fine. That sounds good. Let's try plugging in zero. If we substitute x equals zero into the definition of g n of x, it looks like this. Since zero raised to n is zero, this clearly becomes zero. We found that plugging in zero makes the result zero, but what other value would make it zero? This might feel a little sneaky. But let's try plucking in positive infinity. Infinity? Are we even allowed to do that? Plucking in infinity is just shorthand. In reality, it means taking the limit as x goes to infinity. Then, if we move the exponential function to the denominator, since it grows faster than the numerator, the limit goes to zero. Huh. So that's how you think about it. That means the integration interval should be from zero to infinity. Yes. Okay. Let's integrate both sides again, this time from 0 to infinity. Then it becomes like this. The extra term disappears! Strictly speaking, we should check the convergence of the integral, but let's skip that for now. Yes, let's skip it. The only difference between the two integrals is that n becomes n minus 1. So if we define the left-hand side as g of n, then the right-hand side can be written as n g of n minus 1. Oh? Wait a second. We've achieved the target condition! At last, we've constructed the function g. g of n is defined by this definite integral. Written out explicitly, it looks like this. Oh, there's one more thing to check. Let's calculate g of 0. Um... We just need to consider the case when n equals 0. Since x to the 0 equals 1, only e to the minus x remains. Integrating this doesn't change its form. We just need to be careful about the minus sign. First, as x approaches infinity, e to the minus x becomes zero. When x equals zero, e to the zero equals one, so the final answer is one. Great, it turned out to be exactly one. In short, if we define g of n like this, g satisfies the target condition. Therefore, g of n equals n factorial. We finally made it! Now, let's finish this off. We now know that factorials can be expressed using g of n. Based on this, can we extend the factorial? Yes. Since changing the integration variable doesn't change the value of the definite integral, we can replace x with t. And if we replace n with a real number x, we get this formula. This corresponds to the factorial of x. It is known that this integral converges when x is greater than negative 1. Wait, you already knew that? 
Actually, the gamma function, the well-known extension of the factorial, is offset by 1 in its input. Oh, I see! Since we shifted x by 1, the domain becomes all positive real numbers. And so, we have arrived at the gamma function. It is known that the gamma function has this form. I don't know why, but I feel like I saw this at the beginning. In fact, its domain can be extended further, even into complex numbers. But let's end our journey here. Our journey? To put it simply, the gamma function is a generalization of the factorial. But keep in mind that it is shifted by 1 compared to the actual factorial. The heart of this definition is the power rule. This is very similar to the property of the factorial. But the key difference is that only the left-hand side is differentiated. To fix that mismatch, we use the product rule. And the exponential function, which keeps its form when differentiated was helpful here. Finally, by integrating from 0 to infinity, we eliminated the variable t as well as the extra term. This strange integral can be interpreted in this way. Yeah! But keep in mind, this is just one interpretation. In practice, the gamma function is rarely derived. Most of the time, it is simply given as a definition. Thus, the entire journey we took can be explained with just a few lines of integration by parts. The path to derive it from scratch is tough, but going backwards takes only a moment. Even though the calculation works, it's not immediately clear what's going on. That might be one reason why the definition of the gamma function feels mysterious. Just to be clear, it depends on whether you want an interpretation or just want to state the fact simply. I see, it's not about which one is better. This time, what we did was kind of a thought experiment. If someone who didn't know about the gamma function tried to reach the generalization of the factorial with minimal background knowledge, what kind of path might be taken? Huh? That's what this was? Please note, we were not explaining the actual history of the gamma function's discovery. Still, it wouldn't be surprising if someone had already walked this path before. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to support this channel, consider becoming a member. In this video, we talk about the purpose of our membership. Check it out if you're interested. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.